before they come for the lecture, they're on the way. Again, so they have to. Yeah, yeah. But it may fall down, I'm afraid it will fall. Yeah. Oh, no, no. Maybe I can take it. Yeah. Yeah. Won't fall, right? Yeah. Okay. So we'll now go into our next, in the morning we focused on copyright and content and curation. Now we focus on content development. Okay, so content development is another aspect of developing, I mean of e-learning or technology enabled learning. Now when we create content for delivery online, there are certain principles which we need to follow. Okay, so have you heard of Robert Ganiez? G-A-G-N-E-S, it's Ganiez. Have you all heard of? Have you all heard of that? Ever heard? Come across? Can you? Okay. And we have another presentation on Richard Mayer's principles. Okay, so there are two things which you need to remember when you develop content for online use. The first thing, the content which you develop in a normal classroom scenario may not be applicable online. This is because of several limitations. The first limitation is when you are online, have you ever seen a Google, uh, your video on YouTube, you always click skip ad. You, when we, whenever the ad is there, we'll either use a ad blocker, we press skip ad. Because that is actually the ad is creating cognitive overload. That is not what you want to hear, but it's there. So in order to avoid it, you click skip ad. So with your uh, instructions if, to students, you may uh, have the same situation where student may bypass certain content which is important because it's not in the correct flow. So in order to avoid this, we have to follow the principles of cognitive design or basically we should not overload their, their sens sensory input. Okay. okay, let's see what happens. Now when I am speaking to you, you are hearing my voice and you are seeing my, uh, me in front of you, you will also see the slide. Okay, so you are receiving input from different sources, okay? So eventually as the lecture progresses, what will happen is that you may not be aware of it, but you won't be conscious I'm standing here. You'll only be conscious of the voice and the slides. After some time, what will happen? The, the voice uh, will become blur and the slides may appear on the screen. So this is a natural progress, pr progression of the loss of attention span. So generally they say even the smartest, the most genius individual can only hold their attention for about seven minutes. This is what the principles of cognitive design actually say. So that is why usually at seven minute points in your video, when you develop online video, you should somehow create some kind of diversion. So when I'm doing in the class, you can stop. Seven minutes later, oh stop. Then you take feedback. You ask the student, have you understood? Or you can tell him a joke or an anecdote or some analogy based teaching. But when you do slide, it's difficult because your slide is static. You're going to see your YouTube video. It will run for seven minutes and there's no break. After seven minutes, basically you lost the audience. Okay, this is not only principle in uh, teaching and learning, also in advertising. That's why your videos are very, very short. Usually the Petronas and makes the very long video, right? During Hari Raya, Kamathan, they will make a big video. Of course, there you can watch it because they use emotion. They use another indicator because emotion to keep you attention on the video. But suppose you are teaching a boring subject, mathematics or coding or something, which doesn't have, you will lose it after seven minutes. So that is why we use the principles of instructional design. Okay, so you can use the Ganyas. Okay, so you can extend it full, make it full, full and present, the full extend and then we present. Okay, okay. so ah, okay, it's presenting, right? So Robert Genier was, uh, you all have heard of him before? He, the name is G-A-G-N-E, you, you silence out the G-A-G-N-E, so it's Genier's Nine Events of Instruction. So Robert Genier actually is an educational psychologist who studied the way people interact with content and he has these nine principles. You can view the same slide on your respective desktops. Okay, uh, click zoom forward. Okay, so. He, uh, he, if you read his book, it's called Conditions of Learning. He is a book uh, uh, written by him. So, go on, no, next. So, this is basically the nine events of instruction which occur in any multimedia situation. When you are preparing a YouTube video or a online content, this is what happens. The first thing which you need to do when you enter the class of what is known as the YouTube environment is to gain the attention of the student. 
Normally, how do you gain attention in class? When you start your class, can anyone? You can crack a joke, yes, you can crack a joke, okay? Or oh, suppose you are discussing some policy on economics, you can suddenly pull out a current event. Oh, that's what happened in the, when the market crashed. Oh, that's what happens in, when we don't have the proper mechanism in place. So, you use a current event. Oh, if you are teaching political science, you always have Donald Trump. You can always, because Donald Trump is always saying ridiculous things, so he put it online to grab attention and to stop, you know, create attention. Okay. The second aspect is once you have finished gaining attention, you try to inform the students about what they need to learn in that particular lesson plan. You need to inform them because when you, create, when you uh, say that upon completion of this lesson plan or upon completion of this lecture, you, will, you should be able to do this or should demonstrate the ability to. So this is a very important cue for the human brain. So it tells you what you are expected to do. For example, if I just began my lecture without any instruction or... Is it the learning outcome? Uh, yes, it is the learning outcome. So, okay, so this is where it, it changes for multimedia. So, in a class, you have your learning outcomes, your PLO and then your course learning outcome, or you may have a module learning outcome. So, when you make the video, usually the learning outcome is usually one or two in the video because you only have seven minutes to deliver a specific content. So, that's precisely what Dr. mentioned, it's the learning objectives or LOs. The third thing which you do is you create a linkage to prior learning. So you need to have some kind of perspective. For example, if you are teaching uh, a subject which is related to finance, you can relate it to a historical event or uh, anecdote in finance. So you have to create a perspective. The, the next one is to present the actual content. Once you create perspective, you provide guidance to the learning process and then you do what is known as practical sessions in which you extend. I will go through them one by one. The important aspect is to provide feedback in which you provide students with the feedback on what they have learned. You assess the performance and then you uh, enhance retention and transfer to the job, which means you try and ask them to correlate what they have learned with what they need to do in the real world. Okay, so it's a kind of simulation. I'll go through it step by step as we in the next slides. Okay, so let's focus on the first uh, aspect, which is gaining attention. Sorry, it's blocking. So the when we do multimedia presentations, usually you gain attention by using an introductory video. Oh, as you doctor mentioned, you can tell them a joke as well. So, for example, if I'm teaching uh, medical science, for example, I'm teaching about uh, vaccination, I can start off with uh, Japanese encephalitis, which is a common, or dengue in Malaysia. So, that capture the attention of the users, or the, basically your, the audience. So, that's the first part. You can also use a narrative, which means constructing your lecture in terms of a story, or you can establish perspective by linking the, an event in your classroom with an event in the outside world. So I think that's what most of us have been trained to do in lecturing. So, go on. Okay, so this is, for example, I want to gain here. For example, I'm teaching you about uh, speaking to differently able or handicapped people. So I can start the class with this. Can any of you read this? Read. It is Braille, but can anyone read <laughs> by looking at it? No, right? So basically it means, uh, what it's actually saying, if you can't read this, you are illiterate. <laughs> so you are Braille illiterate. So this is what. So this is how you gain the attention of the speaker. Uh, uh, sorry, of the audience in the first instance. Okay. So, so just keep, move forward. Okay. So now for this one, right? I have included slides, and I'm basically not going to. I'm going to take a neutral subject which is not related to science, technology, economics. I'm going to focus on disabilities. Okay. So this is just because it's something neutral and something which you can engage with. So. I'm telling you, the, you as the audience, so welcome to the lecture on disabilities. Okay, so this is my topic. Now, how do I get your attention? Go to the next slide. Okay, click. Okay. Are you aware of this fact? Are you aware of the fact that half a million Malaysians have no access to educational material? Why? <laughs> so that's why I want to get your attention. That's why I use that. Why? Why, why do half a million Malaysians have no access to your educational material? Because I didn't share it. No, because they are, they are disabled. They are di differently able, what you call disabled. Okay, you, what you, you click. So, special needs. So, they have no access to, for example, if you presented your material like educational content, for, you have to do it in braille, or audio, or text. So, they have no access. 
So now we are, as I mean, in terms of policy, we are focusing on uh, access to disabled individuals as well. So this basically is a fact which you can use to promote or gain attention from your audience. Move on. Okay. So now the, the next thing which you tell the students is their learning objective. So as you mentioned, this, this is actually the learning outcome. So this lecture will focus on upon completion of this lecture. So today for our uh, lecture note, okay, go on, just move. Okay. So today we will be learning about people with disabilities in Malaysia with response with uh, reference to the Disabilities Act. So this is ACTA 685, 685 which is the Act, ACTA for disabilities. So if I ask you the question, how will you classify disabilities in Malaysia? Can anyone give the answer? What are the categories of disabilities? You, you won't know. So uh, if you are a student coming into a class where you have to develop educational content for disabled individuals, you have to know the different classes of disabled individuals in Malaysia and address those as such. Okay, go on, go on. Okay, prior learning. Okay, now this is where you engage the student's attention by addressing something which they have learned earlier. Okay, go. Okay, so are you all aware of constructivist and connectivist models in learning? Constructivist. You can go back to your PNP earlier. What is constructivism? Construct our knowledge. So basically knowledge is seen as a construct in which you start off with the foundation of knowledge which is fundamental and then you add con content to it which is in flow, in basically in sync with what you learn. So you build up knowledge in layers. What is the connectivist model? So now currently the older model was the, what we are traditionally thought is the constructivist model in which we begin with fundamental knowledge and add facts and synthesize new knowledge. The connectivist model is actually linked to social media. So in a social media environment, knowledge is very fluid. For example, you have fake news, right? There's an article on nature which says fake news, uh, fake uh, new scientists, fake news spreads faster than real news. So fake news spread faster. So this is actually because of the connectivist model in the social learning. So in social learning today, uh, students learn as a group, as a cohort of individuals for addressing specific knowledge and then they build up upon that knowledge. So connectivism is the new, uh, new model for learning. That's why when you use your Facebook account, you can actually spread an idea faster on Facebook than in a classroom. So that's connectivism. So now we have to look at con constructivism and connectivism in the context of disabilities. So that's how go on forward okay so now now that you have established the given them a shock you established the perspective and you told them what they need to do you go on to the content actual content of the lecture so move on so this can be a learning object object so this is an actual article from the disabilities act which specifies a, a one statement for example Persons with disabilities shall not be excluded from the general education system. But do we exclude them in reality? We yeah, we do. Because we assume that somebody who is blind is not having a high cognitive ability. Actually, there are blind people who, have, who are genius, so, but we exclude it. So these are something which you think about and this is the actual content which you introduce during the course of your lecture. Okay, so this is the content. You move on. Okay. Once you have introduced them to content, the content uh, as it stands alone is not going to have any value unless you give guidance. So for guidance you use analogy and you give them multiple learning paths. Okay. So for example, if you want to compare how do other countries treat differently abled individuals and how does Malaysia treat or how does the ACTA treat in Malaysia, how does it address disability, you can do a, con uh, a relevant comparison and provide the guidance to uh, the students. Okay, so this will establish a kind of balance. Now, every time you create a new reference point, you actually enhance teaching and learning because they have more points to stick onto. They are basically connective points. Okay, so you have one, one acta from Malaysia, you compare with an acta from maybe from USA, one from Australia, one from another country, and you see what is common and what's different, and you establish a context. Okay, now comes the next thing. Actually, have any of you all learned uh, teaching and learning the American way? No do feel? No do feel? 
Have you ever done a no do feel? No do and feel. Okay, so the American trainer I trained in some of the in some it's a different uh, forum. They actually do. They ask you this question at the beginning of the lecture. They give you a piece of paper and ask, "What do you want to know? What do you want to be able to do? And how will you feel after you do it?" So, for example, I'll say, "When I come to your class, I want to know about, uh, for example, technology and able learning. Then, how do you want to apply it? I want to apply it in my classroom to teach so and so. And how will you feel? Empowered. So, these are the concepts which no do feel. So." One of the uh, principles in Ganya is actually practice, and how is is it's done is as follows. Zulmovan. Okay, so how do we practice it? For example, I have my learning content, which is in the form of textbook, which is teaching about science. Okay, for example, basic science. You have to empathize, or you have to empathize with a visually challenged individual, and design your lesson from his or her perspective. Which means you close your eyes, you ask the entire class, close your eye. And try to understand, for example, the shape of the fruit. How will you describe it to blind person in terms of the visual? How will you translate it in terms of the braille? Okay, these are things which we need. So when you do this, you actually emphasize or reiterate what you have learned. So practice is one of the keys of reiterating or basically reinforcing what you learn. Okay, so we go down to the next. Okay, feedback. Now, as a lecturer, because in the modern context, earlier what happens? We are delivering content in the class, and we get we are just assessing. But one of the key contents is the feedback. You are all familiar with AD, right? Your AD model, ADDIE. Everyone familiar with ADDIE? You, do, you all don't know. You all know know about it. ADDIE. Analyze. Analyze, design, develop, implement, and evaluate. So basically, our lesson planning is the we first analyze. For example, I have to teach a subject which I don't know. Zero. I am zero in a subject. I pick up the subject. I analyze the content of the subject. Then I design the lesson plan based on my learning outcomes. Okay, you design. Then I develop the actual slide. I implement it in the class and I evaluate. What do I evaluate? The student. Do I evaluate the student or do I evaluate myself? The, I yes, correct. I evaluate the student. I also evaluate the effectiveness of my teaching material. So if it is not good enough, means everyone got a B. <laughs> means I'm, that means it's my fault, not the student's fault. So that's the way the ID cycle works. So in the next one, the you so you loop through the cycle and you come back again to analyze and then you go into the entire loop all over again. So that's the way we work in the. I mean, with the MQA system is. CQI, continuous quality improvement. So when you give feedback to your student, you can highlight some key points. Okay. So now, because learning is an experience, you can always ask the student, "What did you learn from the process?" <clears throat> and here is how you can improve upon it. For example, if they are converting their material from from visually empowered individuals to people who are blind, you can ask them, "What is the process involved in that conversion?" And what did you learn from it, and how can you improve upon it? So that provides the cues to the students at that level. Okay, move on. Finally, is the assessment, which is assessment of the course content, as well as assessing whether the students achieve the learning objectives. So you can, if they are referencing the act, you can ask them. So this is a very specific uh, query you make. For example, if they are referencing a course material, at this point you can reference specific points. Like Article 21, what does it say? Article 16. So this is more specific to the act rather than to the feeling or knowing associated with it. Done. Okay. Then comes the next part, which is the end process of learning is basically transfer. So you can ask students, you have applied this to this situation, situation A. How will you apply it to situation B? For example, you have adapted the material to a physically or visually challenged individual. How will you adapt it to a mute individual? Okay, that's the transference of knowledge. So when we achieve all this, go on to the next one. Good, next slide. So you can assess, and you to the last one, transference. So that's basically that. So these are basically the nine steps of Ganyes. Go to the first one, the first slide, the first Balik. The, the beginning of the okay. the beginning beginning okay so the main one is slide one 
the one with the circle. The next one. So this is basically what we go through in the entire cycle. So we have the ADDIE model which we use for normal conventional lectures, but this is the instructional model which we use for the Gagne's uh, in, uh, the events, nine events of instruction. So basically you gain attention, you inform the learning outcomes, you do prior learning, you present, you provide guidance, practice, provide feedback, assess and enhance retention and transfer to the job. Now this is what you uh, have to take into account when you design your YouTube uh, videos, okay, instructional videos. So the process of developing slides for multimedia is different from the process of conventional slide development. Okay, So we will now learn to apply something known as the H5P tool. Okay, for those of you all who are not aware of H5P, H5P is a tool which can be used to translate your educational material into open source assessment tools. Okay, so I will show you how H5P is used. 